Today we have a structural analysis problem for all of you civil structural engineers out there, whether you're practicing in school, you're studying for the PE exam, we go through on how to analyze a hinge in our structural system, and I even throw in a little bonus going over influence lines at the end. Stick around and let's get into it. Well, here's our beautiful problem. Three boundary conditions, A, B, and C, all of them pin conditions. The little tricky guy here today, that's why you're all probably here, the hinge. We are assuming all the loads are already factored, and of course our question, determine the reactions at A, B, and C. First off, what I would do is here is determine whether your structure is determinate. <laughs> determine if it's determinate, okay. Determine if it's determinate or if it's indeterminate. Well, um, we know that we have three equilibrium equations, summation Fy, summation Fx, and summation of moment. So that is three equations. And then we need to determine the number of reactions on our system. And you know that we can do this up top. So I'm gonna go in blue here. So we have, since we have a pin condition, we know we have two reactions, an X reaction and a Y reaction at each one of our boundary conditions. So we see that we have six blue arrows there, which means we have six reactions. A structure is indeterminate if the number of reactions is greater than the number of your equilibrium equations, and then vice versa. The number of your equations, at least that I know of, is always three, but then you determine how many reactions you have in your system. So you're already skipping ahead and you're saying, well, no duh, genius. Six reactions, three equations, that leaves us three reactions that are unknown, so we can't solve for them, so this is indeterminate. Not so fast. There is only the loading uh, criteria of this W, this uniformly distributed load in the vertical direction. There is no loading in the X direction. So that means, uh, let's see if I go black here. This blue arrow turns black. So does this one. And so does this one because all of those we know are equal to zero. So that means your six actually turns into three unknown reactions. Three and three are equal to one another. That means we do have a determinate structure. Now there's two ways we can go about solving our system. Um, we can do our equilibrium equations like I talked about, or believe it or not, when I first took on this problem, I actually slipped into influence lines. And I know all of you are like clicking off of the video right now. Okay, pump the brakes real fast. We are not gonna do influence lines at the beginning. I think they are something that is more useful to engineers with a little more experience or that we learn later on in school, if you're doing, taking a bridge class or something, most people I think would tackle this problem using those equilibrium equations. So that's what we're going to do. But at the very end, I will show you a trick to using it that uh, may speed up the time. I've redrawn our figure, so it's we don't have to keep scrolling back up and down. And here we go. So ultimately, I would say summation Fx. You can start with any of them, x, y, moment. Most of the time, I like to start with one of the uh, directional ones before I get into moment. Now you set up your equation. I always put zero on the left hand side and then put everything else. I don't try to balance it from the start depending on the direction and orientation of things. That's just a preference to me. But um, yeah, let me know down in the comments if you like to do it a different way. R A Y. Here we have R B Y. And here we have R C Y. All of those need to be equal to zero, which we proved. Okay, great. Now we will go summation F Y equal to zero. What do we got? Our demand on our system. So 1.4 kips and that is acting downward. And and um, for this instance, I'm gonna say downward is negative and upward is positive. And then I also say uh, clockwise is negative for moment and counterclockwise is positive for moment. So those are the symbols and the signs I'm gonna be using today. So negative 1.4 kips per lineal foot. We have 20, five, 20 and five. So we have 50 feet of our system that is getting that applied load on it. And then what do we have to oppose that load? We have our three boundary conditions and our Y component of the boundary conditions. So, and they're all acting to counteract that downward force. So they're all on the same team. So plus, because this is the negative term, so that means the plus is the counteracting term. I may be going a little too far in depth here, but I'm just gonna roll with it. And you know, we're gonna, we're gonna see how it goes. R A Y plus R B Y plus R C Y. And that broken down a little bit more gets us the following. All right, we can't solve any further and we still have three unknowns. So let's hopefully use our final equilibrium equation to fill in the pieces. Now, you can take the summation of moment about any point on your system and you can use this, you'll learn throughout your career and as you get better at this, that placing your point of interest at different points of your system can be beneficial to you. It can eliminate more than a single unknown. It can eliminate 
eliminate many unknowns if you're looking at like a trust or something, remember that. Use it to your advantage. Start to learn over time and understand areas where you can eliminate multiple unknowns by placing a moment there. That's the key. Another one. And I'm gonna take moment at the hinge, believe it or not. And I always like to say at, and then whatever the area is that I'm taking it, that way, if I have to take multiple moments, it just keeps it clean in my calculations. Now, the rule with the hinge is that it can translate shear through it, but it can translate moment through it. There is no internal couple that can translate a moment from one part of the system to the other through a hinge. And because of that, you can simplify your equation here. So we're taking it at the hinge, I'll go blue. And what I like to do is I actually like to put my thumb or my finger right on that blue circle, the point of interest that I'm taking my moment about. It just helps me internally. And now you just start summing your moments. So negative RAY times a moment arm of 20 feet back to the hinge. Plus, what else do we have? Um, you may say, well, we have RBY, we have RCY, we have um, our, you know, our demand here on the system. Uh, so let's do that. Let's do the demand first. Well, let's take the demand on one side of our blue circle and then on the other side. So we'll take it on the left side first. So that means we have 1.4 KLF times 20 feet. And then the moment arm is to the center point of that uniformly distributed load. So you could do 20 feet over two, which is the same thing as just saying 20 squared all over two. And that is um, going clockwise or counterclockwise. So that is positive. And and now what about the right side of the hinge? Well, here's the thing. We are summing moments right now. And I said before, a hinge, you cannot translate moment through a hinge. So you can only look at one side or the other side when you're summing your moment at a hinge. You, you can't take both because the, the side that you're looking at, okay, you can sum all your moments, but then all of the other crap on the other side of that hinge can't translate through it. So therefore you can ignore it. So that means that your equation is complete. You don't have to think, you don't have to add RBY, RCY or anything else. This is it, that's it. So, and you look here, now you only have one unknown in your equation, which means you can solve for it. And now you have the first solution to your question. Churn all that out and that gets you RAY equal to 14 kips with an upward reaction. And wait a second, if you're calling BS a little bit, well, stay tuned to the end. I'm actually going to show you how to solve this same uh, RAY using an influence line and you'll see that it gets you the same answer and it shows through the influence line diagram itself the, the concept of a hinge not being able to translate moment. Now, let's take our summation of moment about C. You could take it about B, you could take it about C. Let's take, I'm gonna split this equation up into the two different um, positive moment directions and negative moment directions. That's how I like to do it to keep it clean and level in my head. So zero is equal to, let's do the negative first. And like I said, back up here, that's how I'm denoting negative and positive moment. Let's go with the demand first. So negative 1.4 and now, sorry, go highlighter. We are taking our moment about right here. So negative 1.4 uh, KLF times five feet. We're taking the this chunk right here to the right because that's force coming down, which means it's doing this kind of moment, which means that kind of moment is negative. Um, and then, you know, so that's your force. Your moment arm is half the distance of your distributed length. Um, so you can actually, again, you could do times five over two, but that's the same thing as just saying five squared over two. You also have another variable that is creating that clockwise moment, the negative moment, and that is your RBY because your RBY is now pushing up and now there's your moment arm, which is creating this moment, which is continuing. Yeah, I know, broken record. All right, I'll just, I'll show it by by uh, by these, these little drawings I'm doing. Okay, RBY, and I'm subtracting because this first variable is already negative. So negative minus a negative combines it because it's adding to itself. RBY is your force, but it's unknown. We don't know it yet. Of a moment arm of 20 feet. And that's all that it is, because that is a point load. That that uh, boundary condition is a point load, it's not distributed. So it's just the force and then the 20 is the moment arm. All of that jumbled up gets you your maximum clockwise negative moment. Well, what about the positive moment, the counterclockwise? Let's do our demand again. Now we're taking demand on this side. But again, like we talked about before, we're only taking it up to the hinge because anything now, now we're looking at uh, an area that is to the right of the hinge. 
So any forces to the left of the hinge, we can ignore. 1.4 KLF, this time it's positive, times 25 feet. To the midpoint of that, same thing, you can square it over two. Okay, that's our demand. Um, what else do we have? You may be saying nothing, we're all done, right? You said you can't, can't do anything else. Well, no, come closer. Here's the last bit about the hinge that you need to remember I said. Moment can't translate, but shear can translate through a hinge. So while there's no moment associated with, if I go highlighter, the distributed load over here, you do need to remember that there is this big ass reaction that has built up um, that is being supported by the hinge. Because if you looked at the deflected shape, uh, if I go, I'm gonna go blue, this thing is gonna deflect. And let's say it does that. Let's say you have a, an infinitely stiff rigid body over here. I know I'm starting to say words that you're like, oh, oh God, that sounds scary. But just picture it like this. Say that the solid blue line never deforms. Say it's like super ultra massive wide flange steel. And the member that you have, the highlighter member is something very small. It's a piece of pasta, um, not cooked. So it's gonna deflect because it's being supported by reaction A. And it's also being supported by this hint. No moment going through there, but what would happen there? You're just gonna get single curvature and it's acting like a simple pinned pinned condition. Just a simply supported beam pinned on each end. That ultimately means that your shear diagram, it would be symmetric, which means that you do have a shear reaction. Well, just like that, we can solve it. We know that we need to solve for this reaction X. Um, I will solve right here, X, like I just proved to you is a simply supported beam. How do we get the shear reaction at the end of the beam or the, you know, the, the boundary reaction? It's just equal to WL over two. Plug everything in, that dumps out 14 kips. And you know, you can check in your head and say, I know I'm doing this right because that answer that you just got solving for X needs to be equal to R A Y. And lo and behold, I get my head out of the way. It is 14 kips. So you've proved it to yourself that, okay, you, you just did that correctly. If you kind of thought one step ahead, you didn't need to solve for X. You could have just substituted and said, I know X needs to be equal to R A Y. So R A Y, there's a 14 kip reaction at the hinge. Let's move on. So now we need to account for it. And um, we know that it's going counterclockwise, so it's positive moment. So that addition is 14 kips, and its moment arm is five plus 20 feet. So 25 feet, and there you have it. There's your full equation. Sorry, I was in, head was in the way a little bit. Um, we reduce all that, gets the following. Negative 17.5 kip feet minus 20 RBY plus all of that jazz is 787.5 kip feet, so. Boom, boom, all of that's equal to zero. We solve further, gets us the following. And now we have just a final unknown, RCY. We don't need to take another uh, uh, summation of moments anywhere. That would take a really long time. Instead, we can utilize the equations we've already done. Now we're gonna uh, go and check out our FY summation and we're gonna use, if we go, go green, this equation right here because we have RAY, 14 kips. We have RBY at 38.5 kips. And so that just leaves us RCY, which dumps out 17.5 kips for RCY. All right, for those of you who have stuck around, here's the influence line trick. Now we are going to take influence line for um, our boundary condition A, our reaction. Influence lines, there's different rules for finding reactions, for finding shear, and for finding moment. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of those today. I have some in-depth videos that you can check out. Uh, I'll throw some kind of thumbnails up there for you. What we need to do is the boundary condition that we want to know, we actually need to erase. So we, in this case, want to know R A Y. Well, let's erase the boundary condition. I'm actually gonna get rid of these two. And what you do is you apply an upward force of one unit. That's it, sounds a little crazy. And then you draw the deformed, deflected shape, and then you go from there. Pause the video before I draw this. Try to draw it yourself based on the description I just gave you. All right, there's mine. How does it compare to yours? 
Did I bamboozle you a little bit? Are you kind of like, what the hell's going on? Um, if by chance you tried drawing it like this, if you went, I'll go green, dashed, if you did something, you know, like that, unfortunately that is not the case because we have this pesky hinge. Remember, moment can't translate through the hinge. So realistically, if you're pushing up at your boundary condition, you're just gonna get this one piece of your system to just rent, just turn. Actually, let me get my mola kit. And let me show you really fast. If we're pushing up just one, there's no rotation of that hinge. Everything stays linear. So there you go. If you didn't have a hinge there, say again, my fingers are uh, reaction B, my finger pointing up is reaction A, now, you have curvature in your system, which means you have moment translating all the way through. Something very different happens. We don't have that case though. We have that hinge. And now you're saying, okay, great, pretty picture. What are you gonna do with that? How does this, you know, how does this help me solve to get the numeric value? That's what I'm on YouTube for. That's why I'm here. The equation RA can be solved with the influence line by simply summing the area under the curve of the influence line, which would be all of this. It would simply equal the equation of one, because that's our one unit is the height of our triangle, times 20 feet, that's the other unit of our triangle. Um, that would give us the rectangle right here, right? But we have a triangle, so divide by two. That gets us the green area under the triangle. And now you take that and multiply by a force. And we know that our force, our demand, is the 1.4 KLF. So we multiply it by that. And that spits out 14 kips for reaction A going upward. R-A-Y, excuse me. And now you're moving on from there. Now you could continue to use influence lines. I think that actually, I did this and it takes a little while. So I don't think that's something very beneficial to do. Um, to save time. I think using a blend of this and then moving on to using your equilibrium equations may be potentially the way to go if you're feeling confident with influence lines, that is. If not, going soup to nuts with uh, your equilibrium equations is, is always a great bet. Appreciate every single one of you in here today in the auditorium. If you enjoyed today's content and you learned something new, hit that like button down below. If you're still feeling foggy or if I made a mistake, obviously, I'm, I'm human leave a comment down below and let me know what's going on. Consider subscribing so you catch all of my latest videos and all this continuous practice problems for you to soak up and understand. And if you wanna take it one step further, consider joining Team Kestiva. Every contribution just helps me really make more content, better content, better quality. Everything I get goes right back into it. So all of the people who already have joined, I appreciate every single one of you. All of your contributions really mean a lot to me. Enough rambling, I'm out of here, you're out of here. Catch you in the next one, peace.